So 25 minutes is not a, long, a lot of time to discuss a topic which I know is very important to a lot of IBD patients, which is managing on a day-to-day -day basis with the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. And specifically, we'll be addressing how to manage pain as well as fatigue, which are obviously very common in IBD and really affect the quality of life of IBD patients, as I know everyone in this room can attest to. So we think of inflammatory bowel disease as a systemic disease. Um, obviously, the inflammation can start in the bowel, and that's often where the inflammation is the most severe and can cause symptoms of abdominal pain, diarrhea, and bloating. We call these intestinal manifestations of IBD. But also we know that the inflammation can spread outwards into other parts of the body, the skin, the joints, the eyes. Um, and also, this inflammation can cause secondary uh, complications, such as malnutrition, and all of these can cause extra-intestinal uh, symptoms, um, so symptoms around the rest of the body outside of the bowel. Again, I will be addressing um, abdominal pain, um, the or intestinal pain, as well as uh, uh, focusing on a type of extra-intestinal pain or joint pain, which is the most common type of extra-intestinal pain in IBD patients, as well as fatigue, which again, like sexual health, is probably not addressed enough by um, IBD providers. So I think a key uh, distinction when addressing um, how to manage these symptoms are to really distinguish if your symptoms are inflammatory or not. So inflammatory means that the symptom is actually directly caused by the inflammation in the bowel or active IBD or a related inflammatory disorder. So examples of intestinal inflammatory pain include obviously active enteritis or small bowel inflammation, active colitis or colon inflammation, also abscesses or fistula, which um, are primarily seen in Crohn's disease. <clears throat> Extra-intestinal inflammatory conditions include IBD-associated spondyl arthritis. This is a specific type of joint pain that is seen in IBD patients and is directly related to the bowel inflammation. Also, there are types of fatigue which are really directly derived from inflammation in the bowel. Um, this is related to something called cytokines, which is produced by the immune cells, and it's very important in creating the inflammatory cascade, but as a byproduct does cause very severe fatigue, and this is um, you know, obviously very, uh, very commonly seen in patients with active IBD. <clears throat> In terms of non-inflammatory symptoms, um, and I want to emphasize that even if these symptoms are not necessarily derived from inflammation, they can cause still a very profound effect on quality of life and can be quite severe. Um, intestinal non-inflammatory causes of abdominal pain include strictures and obstructions, which are really due to scar tissue or fibrostenotic changes, um, but also IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is a very common uh, complication seen in IBD patients. So this is even when the bowel is in remission, patients can have very similar symptoms as when their IBD is active. Um, extra intestinal uh, non-inflammatory manifestations include arthritis, run-of-the-mill arthritis, metabolic-related fatigue, so this may be related to vitamin deficiencies, but not necessarily the cytokines that drive inflammatory fatigue. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, I have a, I'm getting over a cold, so my voice is a little bit, <clears throat> and my cough is a little bit dry, but. Um, and then finally, sleep disorders, a uh, very common cause of fatigue, and we'll be addressing sort of practical uh, ways to address sleep disorders. So in terms of inflammation-related abdominal pain and fatigue, so really we can distinguish based on the tests that you're already undergoing to see if your IBD is being controlled. So colonoscopy, CT or MRIs, blood tests such as CRP, stool tests such as calprotectin. So classically, IBD-related abdominal pain um, is due to bowel damage, and we learn that potentially Deeper ulcers or fistulas can cause sharp pain versus um, inflammation that affects uh, less deep layers of the bowel wall can create more dull and cramping pain. Now, this is obviously there's a pain is a spectrum, but these are sort of classic ways we think about how pain is perceived. Um, 
Fatigue, um, again, is, is oftentimes due to an overactive immune system in which these cytokines, of which a very common one is, for instance, TNF-alpha, um, produces profound fatigue. Now, for abdominal pain and fatigue that is directly related to inflammation, as you might imagine, they're most effectively, these symptoms are most effectively treated by treating the underlying IBD. So oftentimes this means that you may need to escalate or modify your IBD medications, and that's sort of the key to help control these symptoms. In regards to inflammatory joint pain, um, again, there is these conditions called IBD-associated spondyl arthr arthritis or arthritis, and this often improves, again, with better improvement of bowel inflammation. Um, however, patients, uh, IBD patients can also more commonly have other types of inflammatory joint conditions, such as ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, or psoriatic arthritis. And oftentimes, these conditions have independent courses from IBD, and so it really requires a multidisciplinary approach with your gastroenterologist and a rheumatologist. Um, and oftentimes, medicines need to be discussed because they may either overlap or you may need combinations or adjunct therapies to really treat both conditions. In addition, um, there are several non-medicinal treatments that are quite effective for inflammatory types of joint arthritis. So classically, uh, inflammatory arthritis tends to be characterized as a stiffness, particularly in the morning or with disuse. And so actually movement or activity can oftentimes loosen the joint and improve pain. So it's really recommended for inflammatory arthritis to, um, to exercise on a regular basis, be it, it can be gentle exercise and it should be gradually increasing over time. In addition, physical therapy, particularly with conditions such as ankylosing spondylitis can be very critical in terms of improving the joint function. So anti-inflammatory therapy, um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I know previous speakers, Dr. Ha and others have talked about this and I know you focus a lot of this um, uh, during your, your um, office visits with your gastroenterologist. But for the intestinal tract, of course, there's a whole range of anti-inflammatory therapies ranging from budesonide, aminosalicylates, immunomodulators, and biologics, which essentially are therapies that target these specific cytokines. Extra-intestinal um, in anti-inflammatory therapies include things like steroids, and for joints, um, Rheumatologists can actually inject steroids at times in inflamed joints if it's a specific um, large joint. Um, and sometimes oral steroids are necessary, although we try to limit these episodes as much as possible. I'll spend some time talking about NSAIDs because I think classically we've been all told that IBD patients can never take NSAIDs, and there's actually been some more recent data to suggest <clears throat> they actually may not be as harmful as we once thought. <clears throat> Sulfasalazine is a type of aminosalicylate that's used for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis and has a component called sulfa that can oftentimes help with joint pain. So it's something to talk to your gastroenterologist or rheumatologist on if you're already on aminosalicylate and still have joint pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in addition, methotrexate and certain types of biologics can help both joint and intestinal um, infl inflammation. So I've listed here some of the targets of cytokines that some of the biologics that help the joints in particular. So TNF-alpha, including things like um, infliximab or Remicade, Humira or Adalimumab, IL-23, which include things like Stolara or Ustekinumab and Skyrezi, um, and then JAK inhibitors, which include things like Zelgians or Tofacitinib, and Rinvoc or <laughs> Ubicidinib. So NSAID medications, so these include things like Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen. So historically, we were, we've were we been telling patients to really exclude these because we were concerned that they may cause flare-ups. However, there have been recent studies that suggest that modest use of NSAIDs may not actually flare IBD at all. So there was a large study from Canada in which every patient with IBD in a province called Manitoba 
Um, they have very good uh, records of medications that are used by patients, and NSAIDs are actually covered by the Canadian Health um, Insurance Plan. And so we were able to see that actually 49% of IBD patients used NSAIDs despite sort of historical um, advice not to, but there did not seem to be an increase in IBD flares in the patients who used NSAIDs or at least picked up or were prescribed NSAIDs compared to those who did not. <laughs> In addition, a recent meta-analysis, which means a pooling of all the studies we have to date, um, if you looked at the statistical analysis, there actually was no significant worsening of IBD. So in my current practice, if patients do have pain, um, I do say that probably modest NSAID use one to two times a day, if you, do, if you don't have any kidney problems, is probably okay, especially if your IBD is not in a severe um, active flare-up. If, however, you are sensitive to NSAIDs, which is, which is not uncommon, there are um, types of uh, more selective NSAIDs called COX-2 inhibitors. So COX-2 inhibitors are prescription um, NSAIDs, and these have been shown to cause less stomach ulcerations in arthritis patients. Um, there were also two clinical trials in IBD patients with arthritis that showed that these medications were effective for the arthritis and also did not cause an increase in IBD flares. Um, however, it is important to talk to your primary care doctor and your rheumatologist about these medications because they are not recommended in any patient with cardiovascular history or any risk factors. <clears throat> So moving on to sort of either uh, pain and fatigue that is non-inflammatory, but also to talk about treatments that are not necessarily anti-inflammatory immunomodulators. And some of these treatments can still work on symptoms that are based um, on your bowel inflammation, but are specifically are going to be addressed at, at this time. So just to step back, what is pain? So Pain is really either mechanical or chemical stimuli at the level of the body. So you can see either in a joint or that bottom thing is supposed to be a intestinal wall. And so we have what are called afferent nerves that detect these stimuli and bring back those messages to the spinal cord and to the brain. These are called afferent, um, either visceral afferents coming from the bowel or somatic afferents coming from the rest of the body. And I like to really kind of point out that nerves are really just electrical activity. So these, are, these messages are sent by electrical impulses to the brain. And we actually know that elect electrical impulses or nerves and nervous activity in the brain can really be upregulated by many things. So it can be upregulated by inflammation, <clears throat> by past inflammation, by stress, by other kind of illnesses. And so one form of <coughs> IBS, which is commonly seen in IBD, is that prior inflammation may really ch alter the electrical activity impulses and the thresholds, and so can really upregulate the type of pain that is really um, uh, sensed by the brain in the spinal cord. So here is a table of uh, some medications that um, can be used to help with abdominal pain and joint pain. So at the very top, we, um, something that is commonly used in IBD and in IBS are antispasmodics. So these include hyosamine or disoclamine. Um, brand names are Levson and Bentil. Um, these can be used for short-term relief, so they essentially cause or help with relaxing bowel that is spasming. Um, you can see this common side effects include things like constipation, dry mouth, and urinary retention. Um, although with time, most of these side effects do get better if you have to use them repeatedly. In addition, tricyclic antidepressants are a type of medication um, that I do find very useful for something called neuromodulation, which is, again, decreasing those electrical nerve impulses. And I like to point out that even though these were once used for depression and anxiety, they're really no longer used for this purpose. Um, I don't treat anxiety and depression. I'm not a psychiatrist. And what we really learned over time is that these older classes of antidepressants, when used in lower doses, so for instance, for depression, 
medications such as disipramine used to be used in doses such as 150, 200 milligrams. <clears throat> for neuromodulation, that, uh, for use in IBS, we use doses such as 10 to 25, so much lower doses, and hence the side effect profile tends to be better than was once seen with, uh, when these were used for depression. <clears throat> and then finally, um, the last class of medications I wanted to highlight was at the very bottom, so um, gabapentin and, and pregabalin or Lyrica sometimes used primarily for joint or muscular pain. These are um, older anticonvulsants that also do the same type of neuromodulation at the nerve level. So opioids, I wanted to just put in a word of caution is that um, obviously in the current environment of the opioid epidemic, we're all very, we all have a very heightened awareness of the potential dangers of these medications. Of course, they are necessary for acute severe pain, particularly when patients need to undergo surgery. But we actually now know that longer-term use of opioids can be um, associated with something called hyperalgesia. So over time, those nerves actually be, can actually be altered, and so uh, patients can actually experience um, higher and higher degrees of pain, and so it becomes this cycle where the pain escalates, and then hence the opioid levels need to be increased as well. <clears throat> In addition, opioids have been associated with an increased um, risk of mortality and higher surgery rates of IBD. So this is why oftentimes we do try to avoid opioids as much as possible. Um, I would be uh, remiss not to uh, discuss cannabis. Obviously, um, cannabis is uh, now legal in California, um, but obviously has been used for thousands of years for medicinal purposes, including for pain. <clears throat> we do know that there are natural cannabinoid receptors in the brain, spinal cord, and gut, and that when bound to cannabis, it can decrease pain perception um, at the level of the 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 brain and the spinal cord, and it can decrease gut motility and secretion, so decrease diarrhea. There have been several clinical trials that have uh, studied the efficacy of cannabis in IBD, and most of them did show a positive improvement in terms of quality of life and symptoms. <clears throat> However, it is important to say that most of these studies did not include any um, any evaluation of, the, of treatment of inflammation or active inflammation in regards to things like CRP or colonoscopy. So there's still not enough data in regards to this use of cannabis as central treatment for IBD. <clears throat> and there's, of course, some concerns of potential complications of long-term cannabis use. So there is increasing data that there are increased motor vehicle accidents um, in states that have um, legalized cannabis. There's also some pretty striking uh, neurological data that um, memory impairments can also occur with long-term use. And then finally, there is a rare complication called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome in which patients who use marijuana on a daily basis <coughs> can experience pretty severe episodes of nausea and vomiting. So moving on to other sort of non-medicinal or non-drug-related uh, therapies for pain. So there is um, an increasing amount of data to support mindfulness-based therapies. I know this has been sort of repeated in several talks, um, that, but have been shown to be uh, effective in decreasing symptoms and quality of life in IBS. Um, so, you know, there are several courses that you can take online, um, as well as many apps that you can download to help kind of make sure that mindfulness becomes a daily um, routine rather than sort of an intermittent uh, practice. Also, cognitive behavioral therapy and gut-directed hypnotherapy have become kind of established and um, uh, well-researched types of therapy for IBS and abdominal pain. So moving on to talking about fatigue. So fatigue is a pretty complicated um, syndrome, but it essentially is defined as not just mere tiredness, but it's really profound daily um, tiredness that in not just cognitive, but also somatic or throughout the body for most of the day on most days. 
Um, and there are multiple causes, as you can see listed here. So we talked about inflammation as being an important cause. Also, things that we see very commonly in IBD, so anemia or low blood counts, micronutrient deficiencies, um, particularly the ones listed there, iron, B12, and folate, malnutrition from diarrhea or restrictive diets. Dehydration is, I think, an under-recognized cause of fatigue, so um, many patients um, that I see do not probably drink enough fluids to account for the losses they may have, especially during active IBD uh, flare-ups. And so you really want to make sure you're drinking enough fluids. And one kind of key is that your urine, at the end, every time you urinate, should be really a lightish yellow. And if it's any darker, you probably are dehydrated. And it can be a surprisingly <coughs> easy way to decrease fatigue. Um, sleep disturbances, very common in IBD, and we'll talk a little bit about sort of practical strategies to improve your sleep. And then finally, mood disorders, including depression and anxiety fatigue, is certainly um, uh, increased with these, um, with these uh, disorders. So anemia, we know, is very common in IBD patients, as common as 68% of patients in the studies. Um, the most common cause is iron deficiency. And we often know that oral iron can be poorly tolerated in IBD patients because it can cause abdominal pain or constipation. And actually, more studies have shown that IV iron can be a more rapid way to improve fatigue and quality of life in IBD patients. So it is something that I am <coughs> increasingly using in my own practice. <clears throat> in addition, B12 and folate um, can cause anemia as well as muscle and joint weakness. And so these are important things to be evaluated for. So fatigue is strongly correlated with poor sleep quality. Thank you so much. Um, and daytime sleepiness. There's recent studies that even support that <coughs> uh, poor sleep can increase pro-inflammatory cytokines um, that are uh, important in, in uh, propagating inflammation. And um, studies suggest that as many more, as 55% uh, of IBD patients do have poor sleep. And of course, this could be caused by nocturnal bowel movements, abdominal pain, and a higher rate of anxiety and depression amongst IBD patients. So uh, in terms of how to improve sleep, right, this is the million dollar question. This is a million, multi-million dollar industry. Um, but, you know, melatonin, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, those have actually all shown to have modest um, effectiveness for it, treating insomnia. There are, of course, prescription medications. However, these all work better um, if, in, uh, if you use them to transition to better sleep habits and better sleep hygiene. And so sleep hygiene, you know, I actually have a newborn baby at home, and so we're now uh, disciples of good sleep hygiene to try to uh, set in good habits. And I think many of us may have had these at one time and then we lose them as life gets busy and complicated. But we really need to make sleep a priority because it's important for restoration. We know that it helps decrease inflammation. <clears throat> so we really have to prioritize it as important. So a couple of tips from the Sleep Foundation. Try to go to sleep and wake up at around the same time, whether or not it be a weekday or a weekend. Make gradual adjustments when trying to set an earlier bedtime, so don't go from 2 a.m. and all of a sudden try to go to bed at 8 p.m. in one night. Uh, create a consistent bedtime routine. So same order of things. You kind of train your body, Pavlovian style, to do the same things every night and kind of coaxes or tricks your brain into going to sleep. You want to avoid blue light, so any kind of electronics should be out of the bedroom and don't look at them 30 to 60 minutes before going to sleep. Avoid using your bed for anything else besides sleeping, so take the TV outside. Um, obviously reducing coffee and alcohol before you go to sleep, and then you res should restrict any naps um, to less than 60 minutes and earlier in the day, earlier than 3 p.m. if possible. <clears throat> And I think actually that is my last slide. So um, I will, I think, take questions at the end with the panel. So thank you all for your attention. <laughs>